Man. And we're in chapter 12. Can you scoot my scoot the camera up? Or I'm just I did a yeah I've got a crack right there just hit me right in yes <laughs> or it's moving how about hey can we scoot down this way a little bit that'll solve it will that be okay you're not yep. um I got your arm. Yeah, it's getting... My head? Uh, your arm. There you go. You're good. Wait a All right, well, let's have a word of prayer. And we're in Revelation chapter 12. Your Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for yourself today, for each one here. I pray as we study the word of God together, it would be a help, a blessing, and an encouragement. We pray the Holy Spirit would have liberty to minister to each and every heart, Father. And we just pray for those uh, who are coming to the service at 9, that you watch over them and bless that service also. We pray and ask that you would use the live stream ministry, Father, and the internet ministry, and that we might have the joy of touching many lives through that as well. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we had started last week in Revelation 12, and if you can't hear me, uh, this is as loud as it gets. If you want to scoot up closer... Boy, all our shades over there, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, just as we added a new wing onto the Woodley Dome, I was told this morning that we're going to be allowed to go back inside next, uh, starting tomorrow. Oh. Starting tomorrow. So. Twenty-five if... percent capacity, though. Pardon? Twenty-five percent capacity. Right. Twenty-five percent capacity. Right. Well, we can get about four hundred in our building. <laughs> so. <laughs> We've had them and for a funeral, so anyhow. So yeah, we're good to go there. So if that's the case, then we'll do, we'll still have go to meeting for those who can't make it, but we'll be here at the church for trying to get back to our regular prayer meeting. And then we'll also go back to our regular times next Sunday, if that's the case, and we can meet back inside. Although I may just do an eight o'clock early bird for those of you who just like getting up early. No, and uh, <laughs> so, so see. will you have uh, in Revelation in the afternoon or just? No, I'm at a, a Revelation. I'll I'll move back to five o'clock okay, if we can go back inside. Yeah. And we'll try and go back to our regular Sunday school okay. before the persecution started and yeah. do that. Man. So we had started in Revelation 12 verses one through six on a great wonder in heaven, and the great wonder in heaven began with the woman that John saw, Roman numeral 1, verses 1 and 2, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And I'm not trying to reteach this, but um, she's going to come up throughout the chapter, so I'm going to uh, drop back to verses 1 and 2 just to pick that up. Uh, the Catholic Church argues it's Mary, uh, we don't believe that's the case because statements made here apply to, can only be true during the future tribulation period. And Mary has been long dead and gone for some 2,000 years. So uh, she's not going to be running around in the tribulation for three and a half years hiding from the Antichrist. And then there are those who argue that the woman is the church. And we reject that view because... Uh, the church did not give birth to Jesus. And so uh, the church can't possibly be the woman in view. The view that we believe is correct is that the church or that the woman is Israel. And we believe that the vision John had ties in with Revelation or with Genesis 37, with Isaiah 9:6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Isaiah 54, 5 says, For thy maker is thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Jeremiah 31, 32, the Lord says, Which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. And so Israel is here looked at as the woman who gives birth to the Son of God, 
and the travailing that it mentions are Israel's troubles prior to the birth of Christ. And those would go back a long ways. But there were particularly what we call the 400 silent years. Uh, the book of Malachi was written about 400 B.C. And there was no scripture given for about 400 silent years, they call them, because there were no books of the Bible added. And Israel uh, was under uh, Medo-Persian occupation and then under Grecian occupation and then under Roman occupation. And so they had a lot of travail going on. And then we see in verses 3 and 4 the dragon, and this is where we had broken it off last week. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Now, if you are here last week, do you remember we told you that the ten crowns are all located on one head? So the seven heads, I believe, represent seven world type empires that Satan has raised up, but they specifically, I believe, refer to empires that have had some authority over Israel. So I believe the dragon and his war against God focuses on the nation of Israel, and uh, the, the seventh head would be the Roman Empire, and the ten horns that are upon it would be the ten kings that will rise up in the revived Roman Empire in the last days at the tribulation time. Now, Revelation 12, 9 says, And the great dragon was cast down, the old serpent, he is called uh, the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was cast down to the earth and his angels were cast down with him. So there's no real debate on who the dragon is or what symbolically the dragon represents. It's the devil. He's a great red dragon because he's a bloody monster and he is responsible for killing untold millions of people. And in Daniel's chapter 7, in verse 7, verse 20, and verse 24, we have an explanation given regarding these ten horns. So this is a critical cross-reference, Daniel chapter 7. After this I saw in the night visions in the book of Daniel, and behold, a fourth beast, that's the Roman Empire, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now the Roman Empire had a senate, and the senate did have some authority. So the Roman Empire was a combination of Caesar and the Senate uh, ruling over the people in concert. And so it was diverse in that way. In verse 20, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and behold whom, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. So this now refers to the fact that the revived Roman Empire will rise to be a world empire, but at the same time we know there will also be a mighty empire in the area of Russia, and we know there will also be a mighty empire called the Kings of the East, because they will have a 200 million man army that will uh, come into the Holy Land area in the tribulation period. So, the revived Roman Empire is going to be a major player. It will rise up. It will be the seventh head revived under the ten horns, the ten kings. And then Daniel saw another horn, a small horn, rise up. And so what, we are, what I am looking for is the area that was once the Roman Empire to set up a ten-person senate and a president. And then I believe the person that would be the president, it may not be the first one, but that there will be a leader who will rise up to power and three of the kings or senators, if you will, will oppose him and he will depose them and replace them with three others. 
Now the reason I believe that he replaces them is because later in the Bible in other visions there are still ten. And so if he uproots three, but there's still ten, he had to replace them. So the little horn that comes on the scene is none other than the Antichrist. And as we'll see in this chapter, he will make a covenant with Israel, I believe. And that starts the prophetic clock counting down the final seven years of Daniel's 70th week. Now, many people think he will sign that covenant on one of Israel's holy days. Uh, they have major feast days throughout the year. And it is interesting that uh, other events, significant events, have happened during those feasts. For example, the Lord Jesus was crucified uh, on the Passover and then rose during the, the Feast of First Fruits. And then the Holy Spirit was given to indwell the church on the Feast of Pentecost. And so many people feel that there will also be very significant prophetic events on the remaining fall feast, and that could well be. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if they said, let's pick this feast today here in the fall, and uh, let's have uh, a big signing, a big ceremony, and we'll sign this treaty with Israel. I believe the essence of the treaty is to let Israel rebuild their temple and reestablish temple worship. And then after three and a half years, the Antichrist will break that treaty because Satan, as we're going to see, is going to be cast out of heaven, will indwell him, and then will kill the two witnesses that we saw earlier, and then he will set up his throne in the temple and claim that he is God, and that's when they do the mark of the beast. So I wish I had some of my visual stuff here to do some charts and things to uh, help explain that, but hopefully next week we get back inside uh, we can go over some of that and hopefully it will be as clear as possible. So we continue then that the uh, dragon that Daniel saw, it says that he will uh, take the third part of the stars and he will cast them to the uh, earth and that we believe those stars represent angels who followed him in his rebellion against God. Now, we don't know how many angels or angelic beings that God created. Uh, I would surmise it has to be well into the billions, but we don't have a number given in the Bible. We do know that all angelic beings are not the same. We know that he created something of a hierarchy and that some angels have different powers than other ones. We know in the Bible that it uses the word archangel. We also know that Satan was called a cherub. We also see that they're cherubim, plural, and seraphim. And we know that some of the fallen angels have especially strong powers and are incarcerated inside the earth and will be released in the tribulation. So we don't know everything about all of them. We know from Ephesians 6 there are four levels of angelic beings that are pictured where they uh, attack and oppose God's program in different areas at different levels. So for all of the things we see the devil doing around the world, he's got to have a lot of demons. A lot. And whatever he has, uh, there are twice as many that chose to serve God. And so it says that he wants to devour uh, the woman's child. Well, that would certainly apply to Herod trying to kill the babies. And that would certainly apply to his many attempts in Christ's ministry to defeat him and destroy him. You remember that he stirred up a mob to try and throw Jesus off a cliff. Um, they did other things to try and kill him and all of those attempts failed. Now in verses 5 and 6, we see the man-child. In verse 5, and she brought forth a man-child, the woman. So that would be the nation of Israel. Now, so obviously, technically, Mary was the physical mother of Jesus, and but she is part of the nation of Israel. 
And so when she brought forth a man-child, it's still talking about the woman he saw pictured in heaven, which was not a symbol of Mary. It was a symbol of the entire nation of Israel. And, then, and then her child, who shall rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Well, that's uh, ruling with a rod of iron is said specifically to be a characteristic of Christ's millennial reign. And obviously caught up unto God is the ascension of Christ back to heaven. And he is at the right hand of the throne of the Father currently as I speak. Uh, and you say, how do you know that? Well, the Bible said he would. And then also when Stephen had a vision into heaven, that's where he was. And so we're pretty safe in saying that. Verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Now let me tell you, verses 5 and 6 cover a huge chunk of time. And some of those who want to try and take a historical interpretation of the Bible are, are trying to insist that this just all rolls out just, you know, one right after the other, and they're connected in time, but they're not. We see then that she brought forth a man-child. That's the birth of Christ. And then it, he's caught up unto God. Well, Christ wasn't born and then carried to heaven as a baby. So obviously between his birth and his ascension, there's at least 30 to 33 years, depending on what age he was uh, when he rose from the dead and ascended to heaven. And so most, most scholars peg it at about 33 years. So obviously there's a 33 year gap in there. And then in verse six, and the woman fled into the wilderness, I believe that there's now tack on about another 2,000 year gap. And you say, well, how would you justify doing that? Because it says, they shall feed her there 1,203 score days. That's half the tribulation period. So in the book of Revelation, we have multiple references to half of the tribulation. I don't know of any references to the whole seven year period. Uh, it's divided in two halves. We have references to the 1260 days, 42 months, three and a half years. We have references to both the first half and the last half, which obviously totals seven. And so <clears throat> these time references, <coughs> excuse me, these time references in my mind are to show us that we've now jumped forward a big chunk of time into the tribulation period. And the other problem here, and this is why some try and argue that the woman is the church because uh, the church is scattered throughout the world, and the devil's trying to fight and destroy the church. But the problem with those views is the 1260 days. If you tried to make this a continuous thing, then you have Jesus being born, ascending to heaven, and then Mary going and hiding somewhere in a wilderness for three and a half years while the devil chases after her. And, and we just know from what we do have of church history that nothing like that happened. There's no account of anything like that in the Bible. There's no record of anything like that anywhere. And so that's why we think that Mary, rep the woman, represents the nation Israel, and we believe the three and a half years represents uh, her safety in the wilderness from the Antichrist. I would think it would make the most sense that the three and a half years is the second half of the tribulation because that's when the Antichrist is indwelt by Satan, when he seeks to uh, kill everybody who won't take the mark, when he claims that he is God. So I would think that uh, that it would be the second half particularly that's focused on here for the protection of Israel. And I think specifically that the protection has to do with those who are saved. There probably was some measure of protection, the first half, with the two witnesses in Jerusalem. The Bible says that if anybody tried to harm them, fire came out of their mouth and destroyed them. They had the ability to call down plagues, uh, uh, any, basically any plagues they wanted to call down. 
And so they were given by God kind of a blank check for manifesting the supernatural powers of judgment. And so I would incline to think that there were believers in Israel and they believed in the preaching of the two witnesses. And as we're going to see coming up, Jesus said that when you see the abomination of desolation, which occurs right in the middle of the tribulation, he says, get out of Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to tell you one of the things that has always been a question to me. If you're a believer and you're reading and studying the Bible at all, I'm not sure why you would be in Jerusalem at the middle of the tribulation. I, I mean, you kind of have a road map for the seven years. You kind of know what's going to happen. You, you have a starting point, it would seem, in this covenant that Israel makes with the leader of the revived Roman Empire. You roll it out three and a half years, the Bible says there's a war in heaven, Satan's kicked out, and that the Antichrist is now going to go in the temple and claim he's God, and he's going to launch a persecution of all believers. So when Jesus said, if you're in Jerusalem, get out. Don't even come down and pack your suitcase. Get out. And I've inclined to think maybe you should have caught a plane out of there a week or two ahead of that maybe huh <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure why anybody would be left but at any rate the devil wants to destroy Israel and the Bible said that there will certainly be Jewish people who will flee into the wilderness and that God will protect them from the Antichrist now Psalm 2 7 through 9 says I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And so we have here a specific reference in Psalms to Jesus reigning with a rod of iron and that is quoted here in Revelation chapter 12. Now, in verses 7 through 12, we move forward to the war in heaven. John saw a great wonder in heaven, and now he's going to see a great war in heaven. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Now, I know... You know, for younger people especially, unfortunately, I think in their minds, they're conjuring up pictures out of Star Wars or, uh, you know, some other sci-fi movie. And they're probably in their minds seeing the devil and Michael having some kind of a lightsaber sword fight or something. What kind of weapons did they have? I have no idea. The Bible doesn't say. How was there a war? What, what was involved? I have no idea. The Bible doesn't say. Everything we know about this war, I just told you. <laughs> there was a war in heaven. So, now, you need to understand the word war is just the idea of a conflict, a confrontation, a, two opposing forces colliding, if you will. When Satan fell, Michael became the archangel. He assumed the place of leadership over the angelic host vacated by Satan. And it says they fought against uh, the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and availed not, prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So Satan and demons, demonic angels, fallen angels, have been allowed access into heaven and are currently allowed access into heaven. And the Bible says that they use this access into heaven to go before God and accuse believers. And so the way it basically works is demons are assigned to follow and watch believers. And 
when they see believers do certain sinful things, they go up into heaven and ask permission of God to inflict some kind of chastening, some kind of suffering upon them. And so, I know sometimes people, you know, when you tell them that, they're like, whoa, you're creeping me out. Well, it's just what the Bible says. And it's, it doesn't need to be something that creeps us out. But what we do need to understand and realize is this, that uh, John in his uh, epistle tells us, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And the Bible says the only thing we should fear is God. We're not to fear the devil. And we don't need to be afraid of Satan. I had somebody tell me one time, they said, well, I like to do my prayer time speaking in tongues so that the devil doesn't know what I'm praying so that he can't try and interfere with my prayer requests. And I looked at him and I said, well, if you're speaking in some garbly gook or language or whatever that you don't know, you don't know what you're praying. And he said, well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I said, so. Uh, I, I mean, that, that just makes no sense. But what concerns me about that is the idea of I'm afraid if the devil were to hear me praying what might happen. And that means that we are now being influenced by a spirit of fear from the devil. And that's bad. We should never do anything motivated by a spirit of fear of the devil. We are not to fear Satan. And if he hears us praying, I mean, the demons and the devil, they, they listen to prayers all the time. And even if they didn't hear you pray, they're still going to watch what you're doing and see if they can do something to try and tempt you, trip you up, discourage you, derail you, get you sidetracked. So we are in a spiritual war, whether we like to be in a spiritual war or not. Uh, the powers that they have and the powers that God have are defined in the Bible. God's powers are infinitely greater and God has promised us that he will not let anything happen that is not something that he can't use for our growth, for his glory, or to further his program in some way. So the devil keeps trying to oppose God, and everything he does keeps blowing up in his face. Just like the devil thought, well, I'm going to stir up a mob to crucify Jesus. And he thought, now I'm going to defeat God. Well, that blew up in his face. Now, the only way the devil can have any measure of success is if we choose to let him prevail in the conflict. If we let him get us all depressed and discouraged and quit. If we give in to temptations and yield to them and sin. That's the only way that he can make any, have any measure of success, if you will, in what he's doing. So, in verses 7 through 9, we see Michael and the war in heaven is led by him uh, as the leader of the good angels and this I believe is uh, occurs exactly in the middle of the tribulation so Satan has not been kicked out of heaven uh, I've heard lots of preachers and stuff talk about it and they say well you know Satan, Satan was kicked out of heaven and when I hear him say that when I, I ask him well when um, and it's interesting um, some say he was kicked out at the garden uh, some say he was kicked out when Jesus died on the cross uh, they're, they're a little fuzzy on the time but according to this in Revelation 12 he hasn't been kicked out of heaven now he's clearly identified here as the old serpent and that connects him clear back with Eve and the Garden of Eden and Satan as being the catalyst for the fall of the human race. So he's wily, he beguiles people, he's a deceiver, he tricks us, he uses half-truths. You know, part of what he told Eve was true, but part of it was wrong. And the part that was wrong was the big part. <laughs> 
And so that's, that's what caused the whole fall of the human race. The word devil, diabolos in Greek, means a false accuser, a slanderer. He's the accuser of the brethren. The word Satan means adversary, that he opposes us and stands against us. When it says he deceiveth the whole world, it specifically is talking about the world system, which John defines as lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Satan uses those three things to ensnare people, trick people, trap them in spiritual bondage. He constantly has a disinformation program going on where he lies about Christ, lies about Christians, lies about the church, lies about the Bible, uh, lies about anything and everything he can. And uh, if, if someone would say, well, I, I'm not sure I believe that. Really? Why don't you just turn on the news for a while and listen to a lot of what you're hearing? and start checking out some of what you're hearing. <coughs> Especially when it comes to American history and world history. I mean, there are people on there who say that uh, there were no concentration camps in Germany. Pretty soon, next thing you know, we'll find out that Hitler was just a Boy Scout leader and that the SS was just the German Boy Scout program or something. Uh, I, I mean, there are people that will come out and say stuff and it's just simply a lie. But a lot of times you get away with it because people don't research it, they don't check it out, they don't study stuff. And so uh, years ago, somebody told me how you can tell most politicians are lying. Their lips are moving. And that's, that's the dead giveaway. Watch the lips. If the lips are moving, good chance they're lying. And so, I mean, there are some... Pardon? That's on both parties? Well, there are some honest politicians, I think. And I'm not saying all politicians lie all the time. There certainly are some who seem to lie more than others. Would you not agree? Oh, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, and again, we're not here to get into a a big political debate, though there are times when I think I might enjoy that. <laughs> but the bottom line is this. While I certainly hope and pray certain people get elected and that godly people and people will try to stand for the Constitution and defend it and the rights our forefathers gave us, while I certainly pray and hope that is the case, the bottom line is this. Our mission per se is to not to build a kingdom on earth. Our mission is defined as getting people saved and in the kingdom of God. And Christians have been carrying out that commission through the most incredible, adverse opposition that is humanly possible. And so we need to realize and stay focused. Well, I enjoy uh, the freedoms and the privileges we have in America. Uh, if God chooses to limit or take some of those away, that doesn't mean that we can't still uh, serve God and worship God and, and do everything we can to carry out the Great Commission. The governor says you can't go in the building, we build the Woodley Dome. <laughs> and and we, just, we just have to do what we have to do to do what we need to do. And we just have to carry on and go forward. And so it's nice to have the building, and I hope we can get back into it. Um, I'd certainly like to get some benefit for paying for it every month. But the fact is, with or without a building, we still have a great God, a great commission, and a great task, and a great opportunity in front of us. Mm -hmm. Now the voice. In verses 10 through 12, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him, that is the devil, by the blood of the lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Boy, this is a tremendous summary of what makes a great Christian. 
Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So the short time is referring to the last three and a half years of the tribulation. Then he will be bound for a thousand years and kept in the abyss, which is inside the earth. And then at the end of the thousand years, he's released for a very short time. He stirs up a rebellion, a massive rebellion. Uh, millions apparently will die in it. And then he's cast into the lake of fire. Now the voice tells us then four key things. In verse 10, he tells us Christ now begins to assert his power over his creation. Now he certainly has had the ability to answer prayer to lead, guide, and direct, and empower Christians, and he certainly has been doing that. But now we're talking about him setting up his kingdom and the ruling with the rod of iron idea. That's what we're talking about. When it says now has come salvation, it doesn't mean that nobody was ever saved until then. It means that the deliverance of the earth from the bondage uh, that Satan and the demons have imposed upon it and evil governments have imposed upon it, that's now going to be broken. And, and so earth and the people of earth are going to be delivered from that. In verse 11, we are told that uh, believers on earth at that time will be perse persecuted for yet another short time of three and a half years. But those who are faithful will triumph, it certainly says. Verse 12 says that a great judgments and spiritual harm will be inflicted upon the enemies of Christ. And verse 12 says the time that this all of this all is the last half of the tribulation. So the voice makes an announcement. And then in verses 13 through 17, we see the persecution. So we see this persecution that's going to unfold. In verse 13, and when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Now, you follow with me here in verse 13 where it says, the dragon is cast into the earth. That happens in the middle of the tribulation. He persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Mary is not going to be on earth in the tribulation. You with me on that? Does that make sense? That's why we know this is not talking about Mary. And this is going to go back to that previous prophecy where we said uh, the, the baby's born, there's a 33-year gap caught up to heaven, and then a huge gap leaping forward into the tribulation period. So uh, we see now that this comes and ties back into that previous chapter and gives definition that this is something that relates to the second half of the tribulation period. That the devil's cast out of heaven, and now he's going to persecute the woman. And so that, I believe, would refer specifically to Israel. Now notice the wings. In verse 14, the wings. There's the woman in verse 13 in the persecution, Roman numeral 6. In verse 14, the wings. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now, here is another one of those places where if you like to write books on prophecy and you have a fertile imagination, the door is wide open. There are those who see this as America sending in it's Air Force and airlifting uh, Israelites out of the land of Israel. There are those who see the Holy Spirit lifting up and flying Jewish people into the wilderness. Uh, just like Philip, the Bible says the Philip, that the Holy Spirit picked up Philip in the books of Acts and carried him to another city. Uh, there are those who think that uh, the Jewish people will get in their own helicopters and such and will uh, flee out of the land there uh, for protection. So what are the two wings 
of the eagle that are given to the woman? Well, there are there are obviously some form of the people fleeing from Jerusalem to a place of safety, but what for sure they are, I don't know. I, I just know this. In the middle of the tribulation, some means will be provided for them to escape. And if you're here and you're watching and you see it, you'll go, oh, well, that was it. That, that was it. That's exactly what it is. It makes sense now. Exodus 19, 4, uh, God says, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. So, Exodus 19, 4 is talking about Israel marching out of Egypt through the Red Sea and into the wilderness and into the Promised Land. So when it says there, I bear you on eagles' wings, he's basically saying, you walked, and I watched over you and protected you from the enemy. So I'm not sure what the eagles' wings are. I give some other references, Deuteronomy, Matthew 24, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Mark 13, 14, but when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of, by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand, let them that be in Judea flee into the mountains. Matthew 24, 20, he said, Pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. And Matthew 24, 19, But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. And so, now I've, I've wondered if those who believe that the covenant with the Antichrist would be at one of the fall festivals, uh, say in October. Well, if you count forward six months, November, well, most of October, November, December, January, February, March, into about April. So if the covenant with the Antichrist is signed at one of the fall festivals there, and you count forward three and a half years, you come out somewhere in the spring at the middle of the tribulation, if that's true. So, uh, I would say verse 20 kind of just gives a little bit of a hint that maybe that's not when the covenant is signed. Because maybe it was signed in the spring, and if it's signed in the spring, then you count forward six months, or in the summer, then that would put you in the winter. So, I don't know. I've, I've, I've many times read that verse and thought, pray that your flight be not in the winter neither on the Sabbath day. I mean, if you stop and think about it, that's, that's really an odd prayer request. I, I'm honestly not 100% sure how the Lord intends uh, those people to take that verse and apply it. I, I'm really not. Uh, it seems like we're pretty much locked in on a calendar and a schedule of events. And, and so that, that is a verse that's always intrigued me. So... May not be too many more years before we find out just what it does mean. Amen? Amen. We, we, we may be real close to some of these things uh, revealing themselves. Now verse 14, the wilderness. And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And so that's three and a half years. A time, double times, two and a half time, three and a half. And so this is why I placed this in the last half of the tribulation period. And then it says her place. And many, as I mentioned before, many people think it's Petra. That certainly is a city carved in stone in the wilderness there, south, somewhat southeast of Israel, of Jerusalem. And that may be the place. I don't know. Now in verse 15 and 16, we see the water. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now the term flood is used of armies overwhelming a fortress. It's possible that that's what's intended here because it says that the flood is comes as it were out of the 
dragon's mouth, in other words, that he stirs up, commands, motivates an army to go after Israel. But the Bible says the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood. There's a lot of people who hold the idea that the place for Israel in the wilderness is Petra, that one easy way to try and get them out would be to just to build a dam at one end and pipe water in the upper end and just drown them. And there are those who uh, have studied that some and have proposed a way that they could see how an army general might try and do that. Uh, if that's the case, if it's a literal flood of water, then the earth obviously just opens up and swallows it. The amazing thing to me is that in this war that's going on in the tribulation, people are going to see things that you would think they would just go, whoa, what did I just see? You think they would do that? I mean, if you said, you know, I think the Antichrist, he's the man. I think he's the man going to help us out. I think he's the man going to going to lead us into prosperity and solve all the world's problems and it's those Jews they're the problems and so he's going to try and kill them all off get rid of the Jews and when the earth just opens up and swallows whatever he's using you'd think people would go wow what are the odds of that happening by chance I mean could that just be a coincidence and yet this shows what spiritual blindness is I don't know about you, there are times when I've witnessed to people and talked to them and tried to answer every objection, show them irrefutable evidences for the Bible, for Christ, and all those things. And they just, it's like they literally, truly are blind. They just won't have it. And then finally in verse 17, the war. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, this would seem to refer to that I think you could go all the way back through the history of Israel as um, having the Word of God, the Bible, as being custodians of it, of the church preaching the gospel around the world, of the two witnesses preaching there in Jerusalem. So her seed would have to refer to those who have been saved through the testimony and witness that comes from the nation of Israel. Now we're going to see here in a near chapter in the future that there's going to be a worldwide proclamation of the gospel by angels. That'll be the one and only time in world history that I know of where such a thing will happen. But that will happen and that will probably happen some well be during the tribulation period. So there we have chapter 12 now, Lord willing, we'll be inside next week. We'll review a little bit as we go into chapter 13. Boy, chapter 13 is the Antichrist and the false prophet. And uh, it is the rise of the man of sin and his evil cohort. And so I hope you'll be here for that. If the news is correct that Brother Mershon said he heard, then um, Sunday school will be at 945 morning worship at 1045 and then the evening service will be at 5 o'clock uh, and the book of Revelation will be in the evening service uh, inside. So hopefully that's the correct news. Father, thank you for the word, the privilege to study it. Help us to understand, apply it. Bless our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name.